The former president, Donald Trump, now claims that an important secret document he's accused of showing to interviewers does not, in fact, exist. This was his first interview since pleading not guilty to 37 federal counts related to mishandling classified material. It was with Fox News' Brett Baer, and Baer asked the former president about an audio tape where, according to prosecutors, Trump acknowledges that he had a classified Pentagon war plan for Iran. Quoting from the indictment here, quote, Trump told the individuals that the plan was highly confidential and secret. Trump also said, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't. You know, this is still a secret. Listen to his response now on Fox News. Brett, there was no document. That was a massive amount of papers and everything else talking about Iran and other things. And it may have been held up or may not, but that was not a document. I didn't have a document per se. There was nothing to declassify. These were newspaper stories, magazine stories, and articles. I'm just saying with the indictments. Some of the other Republican candidates for president have called Trump's actions unacceptable and worse than that, stronger language, including former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, who joins us now. Governor, thank you very much for being here. Thanks for having me, sir. Uh, you've called the charges actually disturbing. We heard this latest claim. It'll be litigated. It'll be dealt with in a court of law. But as a political strategy, what do you make of it? Well, I mean, it's, it's a horrible political and legal strategy. Um, because first off, you know, he... Last night, he said the reason he didn't give the documents back was because he's just so very busy and he didn't have time to respond to a grand jury subpoena because he needed to get his golf shirts and pants out of the box. I mean, does anybody in America believe this? Apparently so, right? Well, yes. Look, I think the problem is going to be for him over time is that people are just not going to buy it. And when you think about how many days of golf he's played since he left office, maybe he could have skipped a couple of rounds of golf and gone through the boxes to respond to a subpoena from a grand jury. Look, the problem for Donald Trump in all of this is his own conduct. He's his own worst enemy. None of this would have happened to him or to the country if he had just returned the documents. What about the reference to, uh, Governor, the, these, these were newspaper articles. These weren't even documents. These were newspaper articles. As a former prosecutor, what do you make of that? What would, how would you... Oh, well, I've never heard about a, a newspaper article being declassified. Um, I don't think you classify newspaper articles because, by definition, they're already public. Um, so, look, I, I think he knows he's in trouble. And last night, I think the worst moment for him was that talking about the fact that he just didn't have time uh, to go through these boxes. Well, in response to a grand jury subpoena, yet he told the government and had his lawyer certify that he had returned all of the documents that were responsive to the subpoena. That is obstruction of justice. And it appears to me last night, as a former prosecutor, that he, had, he admitted obstruction of justice on the air last night to Brett Baer. I can tell you this. His lawyers this morning are jumping out of whatever window they're near. But are his voters jumping out of the window? Because that's the question, right? That will come in time, Tony. Look, there needs to be a repetition to this. You know, the American people have been hearing his lies about this for years and years and years. And there has not been an organized opposition against him inside our own party. And but I'm, it seems inside your own party, people are saying privately what you say publicly. Right. Why aren't people saying publicly... Governor, what many apparently believe, that it's time for him to go. Look, I think that there are a lot of people who are afraid of him. Um, there are a lot of people who are afraid that if they say anything negative about him, that there are Republican voters who won't vote for them. But all the polling that I look at says there's 70 to 75 percent of the Republican Party, primary voters, who will either never vote for Donald Trump or are willing to consider an alternative. So why are you not afraid? He's going to come after you about your appearance, about okay. your intelligence, about your credibility. And you're right, Tony, he already has. Why are you not afraid? Uh, because I've known him for 22 years and he's a paper tiger. I'm not the least bit afraid of him. Um, I care much more about my country than I'll ever be afraid of him. And, and, and your tactic has been to criticize him. But how do you make your race more about you than about criticizing Trump? Well, look, I think, Nate, you, you believe that because that's pretty much what's been covered. Yeah. But I'm talking about the difference between having someone who has governed in a blue state like I did for eight years, working with a Democratic legislature, who learned the necessity of bringing people together to get big things done. I think the difference in this race is I want to do big things for this country. Go back to tackling the huge issues like entitlement reform, like getting inflation down, like making sure that we're a leader around the world again. 
Donald Trump just wants to do small things yeah. and, and, and divide us further, keep us smaller. Um, that helps him. Uh, I want to make this race about very, very big issues and doing those things that really matter to the people of this country. And how would you bring us together? Because we are so deeply divided on everything. By accomplishing things, Gail, and making sure that people know that compromise is not a dirty word. You know, Ronald Reagan said very well, and nobody called him soft. And, and Reagan said, the guy who agrees with you 80% of the time is not your 20% enemy. He's your 80% friend. I believe that you can stand by your principles, but still find a way where everybody winds up winning. We've done that before in this country. In fact, that's the way the country was designed, to create conflict that would lead to resolution. And only if you've had experience doing that, guys, can you do it. And he's never had that experience but at all. Let's shift gears to education. Where do you stand on the Supreme Court's expected decision on whether race is a factor when admitting students to college, whether private or public? I think uh, that you've got to take everything into account uh, about a person's circumstance when they're coming to college. Everything should be, should be considered, where they've gone to school, how they've been brought up. Um, and, and all those things, socioeconomic things, need to be considered because if you're just looking at a dry transcript and an SAT score, that doesn't tell you everything about the person and what their possibility for success is. The other thing we need to do is we need to have a federal program that allows every family in this country to have school choice. If you are in an urban area and you are stuck in a failing school, like many of our urban kids are, their parents don't have the wherewithal to be able to send them someplace else. They should not be denied choice. So race does but, play a role. Yeah. And socioeconomic status. You know, Nate, it doesn't matter whether you're black or white or brown. If you're poor in this country and you're in a poor school district, you have much less of a chance of getting a great education. Agreed. Parents should be able to make the choice as to where the best education can be for their children and not stuck in some failure factory in a city or in our rural areas. And so why not give these parents choice? We say we want parents more involved in education. Guess what? If they have the chance to, to pick their kid's school for what they think is best for them, they're going to be much more involved. Well, clearly you have a plan about many things. I heard you say the other day that nobody does bigger, better than you. That's right. I, I heard you say Thank that. Thank you, Gail. Yeah, I heard you say that, and I think that resonates with a lot of people. But when you look at the numbers as we sit here today, the poll, the numbers are against you. 60% of Republicans say they wouldn't vote for Chris Christie under any circumstance. Sure. What, that's, do, you, what do you say that's about that? That's because I haven't you, charmed him yet, Gail. <laughs> no, Don't worry. But, it's but time for charm, is, Gail. You, okay. you, have a, you have an uphill climb here. Well, well, everybody has an uphill climb. If there's anybody in this race who says they know what their path is, let's take New Hampshire, for instance. Donald Trump's in the mid 40s. Second place is Ron DeSantis at 13, and I'm third at nine. But I want to remind you something. When Donald Trump came down the escalator, June 15th of 2015, he was at 3% in the polls. 3%. Yeah. I was at 8 at that point. Yeah. I had two and a half times Donald Trump's vote. Look, campaigns matter, Gail. If they didn't, yes. we wouldn't run them. And so I think they do matter, and I think I'm going to have a chance to make that case. And yeah. you know me, not shy. I'll make the case. All right, let's go Mets. Chris Christie, thank you very much. Very for being important, here. Tony. Yes, very let's important. Go that's a good note. We're one in a row. We won last time. <laughs> oh, we're one that's in a huge. row. <laughs> Five more wins, and we're at 500. That's okay. right.